Okay, so I'm here tonight uh, from the Apollo team to talk about um, expanding the React render target to server-side rendering and how uh, you can do that with GraphQL and how it's actually pretty easy. Um, so first, hello, uh, I'm James. I'm on the open source team at Apollo. Um, I've helped to uh, develop the React integration for Apollo as well as work on Apollo clients and um, upcoming releases as well as um, work in the community there. Um, so, yeah. So, one of the things that um, I think is really powerful about the React model and one of the things that I think we as a community really love is the level of abstraction that it provides allows us to have different render targets. Uh, things like React DOM, and of course, everyone's favorite with React Native. Um, I don't know if Ken's here, but I'm sure React Crossbow is coming any day now. Um, they're really great tools that we, we can learn once and then be able to start writing anywhere, um, as opposed to the write once and it run anywhere model. There's a lot of power in that, um, and there's a lot of shared just knowledge. Uh, and currently, the most common practices there is just browser and then now native. In uh, server-side rendering kind of gets pushed off to the side, mainly because it's kind of hard to do. And you kind of have to rewrite how your app works to make it actually function. Because on the client and on native, we can declare data needs wherever we want to, all the way down the tree. And that's how we want to write, right? We want to co-locate our data. We want to have our styles co-located, everything in one giant file. Um, and it's great. But that doesn't really work on the server, because then it's not really possible for um, you to do, like, preload that data. So you end up just server-side rendering a loading state, which really doesn't add a lot of value, right? Um, but React is really powerful in that, and React server-side rendering actually works pretty well. And even with React 16, it's going to work even better. Um, there's certainly other performance improvements that need to be done and that are actively being worked on. But it is definitely viable right now uh, to server-side render, but a lot of people don't do it. And a good part of that is just because it's hard. But recently, there's been kind of a, a big growth of what server-side looks like in the React community. Um, you have things like Gatsby, which is incredible, which generates static sites, um, so it's like kind of server-side render in that way. Um, then you have Next, which is the whole premise is router-based server-side rendering with React. And I don't know if you've used Next.js, but it's a great way to do it. Um, and even tools like Meteor uh, with 1.5 release have built-in support for server rendering that is uh, really incredible. Um, so you're seeing a lot more focus on it, and I think that it's going to become more popular because there's a, a real possible win for it. So we're seeing this growth, and the question that I think you need to ask is like, but why? You know, uh, what is it that's valuable? Why should we actually care about server rendering? We're already taking the work to do everything on the client, so why do I want to add something else to my workflow? Um, and there are a few reasons. I think the, the one that everyone always shouts out first is SEO. And this isn't, like, this isn't not true. Um, it's very true that SEO is a lot easier. I know the, the common argument is like, well, Google can understand client-side apps, and it totally can. Uh, but Google's not the only crawler. Um, you know, if you want Facebook Open Graph, you know, it does a decent job, but uh, really it's just a lot easier um, to, for bots to go through and crawl and for SEO purposes to have server side rendering. And if you work on a product team or anything that needs actual users, that's important to bring people to your app. Um, so SEO is definitely, I think, one of the early initiatives for server side rendering, but I think it's less important than things like performance. Um, and I want to quick caveat note that results may vary. It's not a silver bullet like there is no performance silver bullet, unless you found one. If you do, please tell me. Um, but it, it can make a big difference, right? So depending on your target audience and like what your app actually does, and if you're building a collaborative spreadsheet app, you probably don't need server-side rendering because it doesn't really bring a whole bunch of value. Um, but if you're building front-end sites or um, anything that people can start to interact with that don't require clicks, but they need to start seeing what's going on, Server-side rendering can really help you to cut down that time to your initial interaction. Uh, people are happier on mobile, they're a lot happier because they get their site faster, and it buys us time while we work on thinning our bundles because you know, everybody's trying to thin that bundle these days. Um, you, know, you can buy some time with server-side rendering. You can show them content while you try and work on bringing that bundle down and parsing it. Um, and the, the thing that I actually enjoy most about server-side rendering and, and why I like to advocate for it um, those first two things are really great, but there's this idea of progressive enhancement that I think gets lost a lot in our community because we have these amazing tools. Uh, JavaScript's come a long way in the language. We actually really like writing it now, um, which is great, and we build with React, and we have GraphQL, and things seem magical and wonderful, but outside of kind of our tech bubble, um, not everyone has the ability to like, 
run these things on their like three-year-old Android phone or three-year-old iPhone at this point. Um, you know, booting up these big apps is just not great. And so you want to be able to support people all around the world in all sorts of circumstances. I come from South Carolina, and there's definitely spots on like my drive where I have no network connection at all, like barely enough to get a signal. And like most websites, like WordPress sites work, but then fancy React sites don't because they're like loading this big bundle, and it just doesn't work super well. Um, so I think that if we put a big focus on it, it's a lot easier to download initial 30 kilobytes of HTML than it is like 300 kilobytes of JavaScript. Um, so then we can start to layer in all the features that we want to on top of it. And you can only do this with server-side rendering, right? You can't like magically make the client work better yet. I'm sure Google's trying to figure that out. Um, so then the question is like, okay, so we, we know we need it, but we also know it's hard. So why would I use GraphQL? Um, and this is kind of just a spiel. So like GraphQL is a query language for APIs and runtimes. Um, but one of the biggest wins of GraphQL, even if you didn't do server rendering, so like just moving to GraphQL is great, highly recommend it. Um, it can really cut down response times for your app. Instead of making six like stacked network requests, because I gotta get the user, and then based off the user, I gotta go get their friends, and based off their friends, I gotta go get some pictures. Like that stinks and it slows down all our apps. But with GraphQL, you don't have to worry about that. You can make that all in a single request. Um, and there's a ton more value to it, but for us, as React developers, um, it makes it really great to kind of describe your data, not have to worry about how it's fulfilled, and then just be able to use it in your component. Um, so instead of writing out all these fetch calls, you just like write out a string that says, hey, I really like this data, and then give me this data, please, and it does. So GraphQL is really powerful in that. Um, and it can actually make server rendering kind of out of the box work. So with Apollo, um, which is a GraphQL client, and there's a React integration for it, um, with React Apollo, we have this tool that allows you to traverse your React tree on the server and fulfill all of your queries. Um, so you can fulfill all of your data requirements before you actually make the server render. Um, so I think that you know, one of the things that I love um, that's kind of been changing in the React community is we're moving away from this idea of like top level things like you know, React Router 4 is amazing and you don't have these like top level routes anymore. Um, and so but in a lot of ways we're still doing that for data, right? Especially if you want server rendering. So we've got to describe for our entire tree every possible data point that we're going to want if we want to have server rendering because at some point we've got to be able to figure out what data we need to fetch on the server, right? Um, but with Apollo, you don't have to do that. You can co-locate your data and then run a function that returns a promise on the server and then Apollo's just going to fetch all that data for you prior to you server-side rendering. And then you just render a string and you have all of your data. You can actually send that over to the client and like pre-boot up your app with all that hydrated data. So you, on the client, you don't even make another request. Um, so if we're like talking performance here, if you have 3,000 clients making network requests, or you have like one server that's cached that's fulfilling it, and then the client doesn't have to remake those requests initially, that's a, a huge win for all of your ops people. Um, you know, they don't have to deal with nearly that kind of volume. Um, so yeah, there's no route level data fetches. Um, it supports async data rendering. Um, and it's really cool because if you write your GraphQL server on the same server that's doing server-side rendering, you can actually just do a remote um, execution of that. So you don't even have to like make a network request and have it just like turn around and come right back to your server to fill it. You just like call the GraphQL function and while you're server rendering, which makes it that much faster. So it, it brings in this idea of components only, right? Uh, with tools like React Router 4, CSS and JS, if, uh, who uses CSS and JS? All right, it's cool. Uh, so like my favorite right now is Emotion, uh, which is incredible if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. They're all great, the CSS community is amazing. Um, but Emotion's really cool and so we're starting to describe our UI components in the same file that we're describing our render targets, right? So it'd be really great if we could just do data as well and then we've got everything encapsulated. We've got what it looks like, what data it needs, what data it needs to update on the server, and what is actually rendered to the user. So when we're talking about making changes there, I'm not looking at like 30 different files and asking that other team what they implemented. It's all right there together. Uh, and with Apollo, you can do that. And you can do that on the server as well. So I'm gonna try and jump to a demo. Uh, okay, um, so this is a little demo app that I've written using uh, Meteor 1.6. 
which runs on Node 8 and um, is really amazing. And I highly recommend it. If you haven't checked it out in a long time, you should. Um, and I'm going to keep talking about it because I really like it. But so this is a, actually a deployed Meteor app. Um, and it's nothing super awesome except for that it uses the Hello World of the GraphQL world, which is a Star Wars API. So like instead of writing Hello World, you get to interact with Star Wars. So GraphQL is worth checking out just for that. Um, but so this is just a little like sample app. Um, and can we go down and look at what it actually does here? Um, let's see. You know, all we're doing is if you land on the home page, then we're rendering out these movies, and then otherwise we're rendering out the character or the episode. Um, and then we're just going to de declare, you know, pretty much a grid, right? So we just have this like background. We're going to show some movies. So that's this. Um, I'll make this larger too because it wasn't meant for a screen this big. Cool. Um, so we have three Star Wars movies. Thank you, Behance Artists, for amazing work. Um, and then we click on it, and if you notice that white flash, um, and let's see, I'll, I'll go back and do that again. Um, Spotify has really good internet, so I was hoping this would be more dramatic. So that white flash was making a data request. So like I intentionally didn't want to do any kind of loading state and kind of make it jarring to see that you know that was clicking on a link, and that link wrote it, loaded a new route which made a GraphQL request. Um, and normally, you know, most people, that's a lot slower. Um, and then I'm going to click again, and I get another flash, and then click again, and then click again. But then I go back to the day that I already have, and Apollo already has it loaded for me. It's already pre-cached all that information. So I can, like, jump back and forth, and it doesn't make those queries for me again. Um, and it handles all that out of the box, which is really great. Um, but what's really cool is if we go back to the like root level thing. So that was really fast. That wasn't just Spotify internet fast. That was like actually fast. Um, yeah, I think Spotify internet fast should be kind of a thing. Um, you heard it here first. Um, so this is the, the page source. So if you turn JavaScript off, this is what you're going to get and this is what's going to run. And the really cool things about things like CSS and JS is we can know exactly what CSS you're using. Um, so, you know, the top of this is all from Emotion. So these are all the classes that I actually need to render my page, and it's inline. You know, so it's like Google Developer Advocate approved. It's super fast. Um, and then we can come in, and I have all the markup. So like people can see the awesome Star Wars photos. Um, and then I actually have all of the data that Apollo fetched on the server. So that's the results of those queries to fulfill that on the server. And I can send that over and tell Apollo when we start up and say, like, you don't need to refetch it. Here's everything that you're going to be looking for. And then it's just like, okay, cool. Like, that's great. We'll just kind of, like, hang out then. Um, and it's really awesome. You know, this is also how you prefill the style, like, class names. Um, so, you know, with this, you get those near instant first loads. And you didn't have to change any part of your code. So if you have a great working client app right now that's built in React and you use Apollo, it's like three lines to get server-side rendering just working for you. Um, and you can start like seeing all these benefits out of the box. Um, so like, what does that actually look like? You say it's three lines. Um, I'll prove it to you. Um, so React Apollo has something called get data from tree. And when we build out our app, we build out a client on the server request. Um, in this case, we're just like hitting a local GraphQL function because we have it, because it's JavaScript, and JavaScript is magic. Um, and then we just we just wait, we just delay the request, and we get all the data from the tree. And this is going to traverse your tree, and it's going to try and find everywhere where you, you're using the React Apollo integration, and it's going to batch those together in the most efficient way it can to batch all those requests to send to your server. So like every time it reaches an endpoint where there's a GraphQL request, it's going to wait there. It's going to resolve all those promises. So like if you're looking at a React tree and you got like a guy here and one over here, it's going to go all the way down and then it's going to stop at these points. It's going to get those data points and it's going to re-render from that point down. So it's essentially like async rendering but for the server. And then it just fulfills it. Um, and because of Apollo's caching mechanism, the client that you used during that request has all that data. So it's really easy. So let's see, we're talking one line. I don't want to feel like I lied to you. That would make me feel bad. Two lines and three lines to pre-fill all your data and to do asynchronous data loading on server-side render for React. And I think that's really cool. Um, so, and then the last thing that I wanted to kind of say, let's see, is looking ahead. 
Um, so we're in a pretty good place right now. Like I would absolutely recommend this for production right now. There's a, actually a lot of sites out there using it. Um, my favorite, there's a science magazine called like Quantum Magazine. Uh, and it's built on top of WordPress, but it's a React and Apollo app with server-side rendering. And it's super fast and it's really sciencey and nerdy and you should check it out. Um, but it, it's great, so like it works for production now. I have, go try it. Um, but what's next, right? We always want to know what's coming next. Uh, so with React 16, we have render to stream, right? So we, instead of like the synchronous bottleneck that currently is React render to stream, which you know, can really be a hit on your server, we can start to stream that data over, which means the client can start making requests faster, it can load all your data faster, um, you can just have a, a better overall experience for your end user. What that doesn't work with right now is you still need to prefetch all your data, so you're still blocking it at some point. Um, so in the future, I hope to see a render to stream with data. Um, you know, maybe we'll end up building it because it, it would be really helpful. And that would be the same kind of concept. Work the way down, but start streaming those results down already. Um, you know, uh, we want to be able to turn on and off fragments, which are part of GraphQL, so if you're familiar with that. Um, but right now, you can already like, turn off part of your queries if you want to on the server. So a use case for that is, like, say, you don't want to render user data on the server-side render because you don't want that to just be out there. Um, then you can just say, like, don't render that on the server with a Boolean, and Apollo will just ignore that for you. Um, so we'd love to see support for that with fragments as well. Um, and then even I've toyed around with the idea of server-side mutations. So like you want to do analytics or um, any kind of tracking or you know, your server captured a user agent, and you want to capture the same user agent on the client and send it to your analytics service, so you could do that on the server as well. And you could just like, send that data while you're server rendering your app because it's all just GraphQL. Um, so there's a lot still to come. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, and I don't know if we're doing questions, but I can like jump through this one. What's the impact uh, scalability-wise? Like if you have hundreds and hundreds of uh, concurrent users making the same request. Yeah. Um, and really because it's server rendering, the traditional web practices still hold really well. So you could put Varnish in front of the server-side render app and just it never even hits it. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a lot that you can do there. Um, so it, it handles it pretty well. And Node's just great at those concurrent requests anyway. Hey, um, so GraphQL looks really powerful for kind of newer applications uh, and like things that are very clean. Um, do, you, uh, do you have examples of like a migration strategy for bringing GraphQL into very large code bases that already exist? So it actually works really great. So Apollo is, is pretty small all in all, so it's a good thing to add in. And you can start component by component, right? Um, you can take an existing REST API and not have to rebuild it and throw GraphQL in front of it and just like kind of essentially proxy those requests to your REST API. So on the server, it's a really small transition starting point. And then you can take one component, like what is you know, the component that gives you the most trouble or is the heaviest request, and just move that one over. And we've seen that from a lot of people where they'll take small portions of their app or their existing REST API, they'll love it, and then they'll just start like migrating the rest of it. And it definitely works really well. So, cool. All right, well, um, thank you. Uh, I'm on Twitter at, at jbaxley. Um, and thank you so much for having me.